everyone. Welcome to the Quant University Machine Learning School 2022. We are here every Tuesday for the Quant University guest lecture series. And today we are fortunate to have Dr. Kush Varshney, who is going to be presenting on trustworthy machine learning and artificial intelligence governance. As you know, in the last two years, we have uh, had many sessions focused on this intersection of you know, pragmatic application of, of artificial intelligence models in various use cases. And we've been focusing on this notion of risk and what does it mean when you start adopting machine learning models in a production scale? And as you know, the world has significantly changed in the last 10 years or so. Models which were predominantly kind of in the toolboxes of data scientists are now pragmatically used for various applications and it's used at scale. And it's engaging many stakeholders in the ecosystem, the business users, the technology uh, departments, the people who are actually designing the models. Uh, what do you think about fault tolerance? How do you think about ethical concerns? How do you think about explainability, fairness, security? So it's becoming a multi-dimensional issue. And it's not just sufficient for technologists and data scientists to basically build the best possible model. You have to think holistically because there is a, a systemic aspect to be thought about. And in this realm, we have been engaging various discussions, bringing in academics, bringing in uh, industry practitioners. And also, as you know, we have been creating various programs, educational programs to support this, um, uh, bringing all this knowledge to pragmatic aspects on how you can adopt it in the industry. And we have uh, created multiple courses on uh, machine learning and uh, how do you actually apply these concepts when you think about model risk management, when you think about testing these models, how do you think about auditing models? So we have a whole comprehensive five-part program and uh, we are partnered with uh, Premier, which is the professional risk managers uh, organization to offer this program. And uh, we have a live mode, we started a cohort in March uh, and we are starting another cohort in April. So if you're interested, please check out our website, www.quantinuniversity.com so that you can uh, understand the concepts of the program and see if that would be of interest for you to join. A lot of uh, professionals, uh, people at the director level, people who are software engineers, people who are analysts, who are data scientists have taken this course and they've pragmatically applied various concepts in the work they do. So um, I'm emphasizing the word pragmatic because we want to kind of move this discussion from theoretical papers and discussions to actually using it in a real day-to-day -day world. And how do you think about templates? How do you think about operationalizing various things? And in addition to that, we have, um, uh, it's an ongoing discussion. So as you know, uh, this uh, is not written in stone yet. So it means that you wanna constantly learn on what's happening in the industry. And hopefully this guest lecture series we've been hosting every week will be, uh, has been helpful and uh, is gonna be helpful for you to engage in the discussion. So a lot of people ask like, you know, how do you access prior uh, lectures. So if you go to the Quant University webpage and there's a library segment and uh, there many of the discussions we have been having uh, in the last two years uh, can be accessed, the summer school discussions, the winter school discussions, et cetera, et cetera. So please go and check out. And also uh, if you go to our Q Academy uh, page, you will be able to like access some of the slides and other materials uh, out there. So, um, without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Kush Varshani. Um, Kush, um, I got to know Kush uh, because of my engagement with uh, the LFAI, Quant University is a part of the Linux Foundation of Artificial Intelligence, and uh, through participation in various uh, committees and meetings, I got to know about Kush's work. Uh, and uh, it's been fascinating to see some of the work he's been doing and um, his book, Trustworthy Machine Learning, which uh, one lucky winner is going to get at the end of this uh, webinar, um, has been looking at like the various uh, practical aspects of, you know, using uh, concepts of fairness, robustness, explainability, transparency, inclusiveness, and uh, various aspects of performance metrics. So I thought it was a comprehensive collection of various aspects. And also um, he kind of ties it to the pragmatic aspects in the context of the various tooling 
which uh, his role at IBM and uh, his association with various open source projects, so the AIF, the AIX, et cetera. So I thought it would be a good discussion to welcome uh, Kush to this guest lecture series. A brief introduction, Kush was born in Syracuse, New York in 1982. He received the BS in electrical and computer engineering with honors from Cornell University. He received the SM degree in 2006 and a PhD degree in 2010, both in electrical engineering and computer science from MIT Cambridge. While at MIT, he was a NSF graduate fellow. Uh, Dr. Varshney is a distinguished research staff member and manager with IBM Research at the Thompson J. Watson Research Center, uh, New York, Yorktown Heights, New York, where he leads the machine learning group in the foundations of trustworthy AI department. He was a visiting scientist at IBM Research, Africa, Nairobi, Kenya in 2019. He is the founding co-editor of of the IBM Science for Social Good Initiative. He self-published a book entitled Trustworthy Machine Learning, and uh, he's a senior member of the IEEE. Welcome, Kush, and the stage is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Sri. Um, so let me share my screen. Um, all, right. all right, very good. Um, so yeah, this is the book. Um, so it's uh, entitled Trustworthy Machine Learning. Um, if you go to this uh, website, uh, trust, trustworthymachinelearning.com, there's a free PDF available. And um, uh, the uh, paperback version that uh, Sri held up uh, is available at uh, the lowest possible cost uh, just to cover the printing um, from Amazon, so uh, from uh, various Amazon marketplaces. Right? Um, so yeah, I wanted to go over um, kind of what I mean by trustworthy machine learning and then spend a little uh, more time on AI governance. Right? <clears throat> and I've seen some of the questions. I'll try to address them a little bit throughout, um, and uh, we can uh, save time at the end for uh, uh, things that I didn't cover, or additional questions as well. Good. Okay, so this is a pretty uh, busy sort of picture, um, and uh, it kind of um, <clears throat> is showcasing like the breadth of, uh, of what trustworthy AI or trustworthy machine learning is all about, and. Um, uh, it kind of starts with some of the basics um, around uh, supervised learning and generative models and causal modeling, and then goes to um, uh, these uh, other topics uh, as we uh, progress uh, from bottom to top. So uh, the open source toolkits that she mentioned um, uh, that we've developed, uh, three of them have been donated to the Linux Foundation. Um, so that's AI Fairness 360, Adversarial Robustness 360, and uh, AI Explainability 360. But um, uh, there's others that we have also open sourced uh, from IBM uh, as well. Good. Um, so in the first part of the talk, I will go kind of bottom to top in a sense. And then <coughs> in the second half, um, uh, kind of start with governance and kind of explain things that way as well. Okay. Um, so I think I don't have to spend much time on this, but uh, I'm sure many of you have been following the news uh, recently over the last few years and have seen all sorts of examples uh, of decision making supported by machine learning having unwanted biases, whether it's in uh, face recognition, healthcare, finance, educational assessment, hiring, criminal justice, etc. Okay. Um, but trustworthy AI is not just about bias. Um, so. Uh, when Uber had a fatality in its self-driving cars, um, it was actually um, traced back to um, settings of false positives and false negatives and um, uh, distribution shifts and so forth. Um, there was a hospital in Pittsburgh that um, uh, trained a machine learning model to predict the readmission risk of uh, patients uh, who had come in for uh, pneumonia. And it found that patients who were asthmatic um, were much less likely to be readmitted, which is completely opposite of um, uh, what uh, medical knowledge would tell you. But it actually happened to be true in that hospital because uh, they had a special program for asthmatics. But um, it would not have been true if that model had been applied anywhere else. So uh, there's all sorts of things that can go wrong. Right? Um, so the way I kind of uh, put the book together and also like to think about trustworthiness is um, uh, by asking what is it that uh, makes someone or some uh, AI system trustworthy. And it turns out that uh, in the organizational management literature, they've come up with four attributes of what it takes for another person and or an AI system to be uh, worthy of trust. Right? Um, so the first attribute is competence. Uh, so the person can do what they say. 
Um, second is reliability, so that that competence sticks around in different conditions in different settings and so forth. Um, third attribute is some kind of openness or intimacy, so you can communicate back and forth with the other um, person. And the fourth is um, uh, some level of selflessness, so um, uh, you're not working only for your own goals, but uh, something broader than that. All right, and um, these all map to uh, different considerations uh, in machine learning or data science uh, as well. Right? Uh, so the first attribute maps to accuracy, and that's exactly what we've wanted um, uh, for our, uh, our machine learning systems as we've been developing them for, uh, for the longest time. Right? Um, but then there's all these other considerations that go beyond that. Um, so within the second bucket, we have things like distributional robustness, fairness, and adversarial robustness. In the third attribute, we have things like explainability. Um, so can a person understand how a model makes its predictions? We have transparency, um, which is more broad in terms of uh, the entire uh, pipeline from where does the data come from to uh, what feature engineering did you do? Um, what sort of uh, uh, model validation did you do and so forth? Um, it includes uncertainty quantification, sorry, um, as well as uh, value alignment. So in the other direction from the humans or human society to the machine instructing it um, of what we actually want from its behavior. Um, and then in the fourth bucket, we have using AI for social good, um, as well as uh, in some ways more importantly, um, making AI technologies such that uh, all people, no matter what station in life that they're in, are empowered to use AI to meet their own goals. Um, so there's multiple factors that are placing trust in AI as a top priority these days. Um, so one of them is around uh, brand reputation. So one of the headlines was a company that uh, uh, had problems with their hiring algorithm, so it uh, yielded a, a reputational risk for them. Uh, there's much more regulation um, uh, around AI in high-risk situations. So in the European Union, for example, there's a, a draft regulation um, for, uh, for high-risk AI. Um, in New York City, there's a, a, a law that has now been uh, passed for AI uh, used in hiring and um, kind of uh, wanting fairness and uh, explainability there and so forth. And then we see across um, lots of organizations now, including in the financial services sector, that um, uh, there's hundreds or even thousands of models um, in operation um, in, that are deployed. And so uh, managing them, uh, making sure they're well tested and, and so forth, um, uh, including as part of a model risk management uh, framework is uh, becoming more and more important. And then uh, the, over the last couple of years, there's been a renewed focus on social justice in, in many societies. Um, so if we think about it, um, uh, there's this uh, nice quote by Thomas J. Watson Sr., one of the early CEOs of IBM, and he said um, uh, that the toughest thing about the power of trust is that it's very difficult to build and very easy to destroy. So those headlines uh, kind of illustrate for you the easy to destroy part, and um, I'll take the rest of this hour to uh, tell you about uh, how to build the trust. Okay. Um, and if there's just two words that you get out of this entire presentation, it's, uh, I hope it's these two, it's uh, no shortcuts. And I'll explain what I mean by that um, as we go through. Okay. Um, so this is a typical sort of uh, AI development life cycle. Um, so there's multiple stages, starting with problem specification, going to data understanding, data preparation, and then modeling. Uh, then there's evaluation, uh, which uh, in the finance industry would also be called uh, model validation or model risk management. And then there's deployment and monitoring, right? Um, and there's different personas involved in each of these steps. Um, uh, and there's this other set of diverse stakeholders uh, that I'll get back to in a second. Um, so what I mean by no shortcuts is the following. So um, the the easy thing to do is um, that you're the um, problem owner or the data scientist and you just kind of figure out, oh, I'll apply machine learning for this problem and just go and run with it. Right? Um, but what you should really do is slow down and um, actually take a, advice <coughs> from a panel of diverse voices. Um, people especially who have had uh, uh, personal experience with uh, various sorts of harms and um, uh, take their input in both determining should a problem even be worked on and secondly, what should we care about in that problem specification? Um, is it uh, just accuracy or is it other things? And I'll get back to this um, in the second half of the presentation. Okay. Um, 
in the data understanding and data preparation phases, again, the no shortcuts um, sort of idea is that um, you could just take your prepared data as it's given to you and just start uh, modeling based on it. But what you sh should really do is go back and think about um, where did the data come from and what biases might it already have. Um, so those could be social biases. Um, uh, so those would be things that um, uh, kind of uh, kind of codify structural biases that uh, are part of uh, human society. Um, so, uh, for example, um, uh, like in an educational assessment sort of uh, thing, if there's a reading passage uh, on a college entrance exam that uh, is based on some cultural knowledge that you as the test taker don't have, then maybe you'll score lower on the exam, even though your ability to succeed in college is the same as anyone else, right? Um, there's uh, sampling biases, so um, some groups can be under overrepresented. Uh, there can be temporal biases, so um, maybe your data set is from before COVID, and now um, you're applying it, the learn model um, uh, after COVID, and it's going to fall apart unless you pay attention to that. Um, there can be even biases that get instituted um, uh, by data scientists uh, during the data preparation phase, um, and. Uh, bad guys can also inject uh, uh, bad stuff. Right? Um, then we're, when we're in the modeling phase, um, uh, machine learning algorithms are not particularly smart, right? Um, uh, they're just optimization um, algorithms that uh, are just trying to find the minimum or the maximum of some objective function that you've set. And they, for that reason, they themselves take shortcuts. Okay? Um, so on the image on the left, um, the uh, image caption that a deep neural network might uh, uh, bring forward is uh, describing this as um, as grazing sheep, right? When there's no sheep there, um, but uh, it thinks that way because in the, its training data, often there were sheep when there was a green pasture in the background. Right? Um, the system can hallucinate objects. It can focus on uh, things in an image that aren't the patient's anatomy, but um, just tokens or markers in the image can get confused by um, uh, little spurious pieces of text and so forth. Right? Um, so if the machine itself is taking shortcuts, what should we do to counteract it? Um, uh, what we should do is actually um, uh, take uh, uh, different steps throughout the pipeline um, of, uh, of modeling uh, itself. Right? Um, so addressing all of these different topics of robustness or fairness or explainability and so forth, um, uh, we can uh, do things in kind of three main spots. One is pre-processing the training data. Uh, second is during model training. We can um, uh, add additional uh, constraints or regularization terms. And finally, uh, we can post-process the data, uh, the predictions, uh, the outcome predictions as, uh, uh, as they're made uh, to, uh, to improve the model. Okay. Um, so specifically, um, uh, what is an explanation, right? Um, so it's a justification for machine learning prediction. Um, so there was a question in the chat before um, about post hoc uh, local explanations, right? Um, so, <coughs> so that's one kind of explanation. So uh, Lyme and Shap are two common uh, approaches for, for those kind of explanations. But uh, one thing that we like to emphasize is that there's no one size fits all. There's no one best type of explanation. Um, so if you're the affected user, if you're the um, regulator, if you're the decision maker uh, and so forth, um, uh, it really changes what type of explanation that uh, uh, that's most relevant for, for what you're doing, right? Um, so we actually um, work on and develop, I mean, many different types of explanation algorithms, and they're all in the uh, AI Explainability 360 toolkit. Um, specifically on post hoc explanations, um, uh, one thing that uh, I'd like to point out is that Lyme and Shap um, both involve a level of approximation. So um, if you're aiming for safety, um, they actually can let through corner cases where the explanation is mismatched from the uh, the actual uh, model prediction, right? Um, we've developed an approach called the contrastive explanations method, um, which does not involve any approximation. So it's one that I personally recommend for um, uh, a lot of uh, post-hoc explanation needs. Um, second is unwanted bias. Um, so this is something that places privileged groups at systematic advantage and unprivileged groups at systematic disadvantage. Okay. Um, so we already kind of talked about unwanted biases coming from 
uh, problem misspecification, from uh, issues in data engineering, from prejudice in historical data, and from uh, sampling issues. Okay. Um, so when we're trying to mitigate those biases, um, uh, and often these are in terms of uh, so-called protected attributes, things like race, gender, um, veteran status, uh, things like that, or national origin. Um, so when we're trying to mitigate biases, um, it's not straightforward. And the reason for that is because there's other variables that you're going to be using as regular features um, that can actually recreate the information that is present in the protected attributes. So don't just drop those protected attributes, but include them uh, and try to mitigate them. And what you're trying to do is um, have some sort of statistical independence between those protected attributes and the outcome prediction. And if you can break those statistical dependencies, then you're actually um, performing bias mitigation. Uh, so we just recently put out this white paper um, that's publicly available um, on uh, bias mitigation for uh, advertising, targeted advertising specifically, um, uh, for COVID-19 uh, vaccination messaging. So it, it's a pretty good read if you guys want to check it out later. Um, next topic is adversarial robustness. So an adversary is a bad guy. It's a malicious actor trying to meet their own goals, usually at the detriment of uh, the goals of the system designer. Okay. Um, so these bad guys can um, do kind of two things. They can um, make your model worse or they can steal information. Uh, so data poisoning attacks and evasion attacks um, kind of try to uh, make the model worse or fool the machine um, and inference and extraction attacks try to steal um, the training data or um, steal the model and, and so forth right? um, so adversarial robustness is all about detecting preventing and certifying against attacks um, by malicious adversaries and it doesn't have to be that there's a bad guy involved um, so it can also be that it's just um, a way for ourselves to push AI to its own limits as a test to, to see what's going on. Um, then there's uncertainty quantification. Does the model know when it doesn't know? Um, so is it intellectually humble? Can it tell you its own limitations? Right? Um, so an example of this is from dermatology. <coughs> so um, uh, there's eight different uh, possible diseases that can be in this uh, shown in this dermoscopic image. On the left, um, even though the classification is correct, um, uh, like all the classes are kind of equally uh, confident by the machine, right? Um, whereas if we go towards the right, one of the classifications is um, uh, much more strongly confident than the others. And if you have poor uncertainty quantification, uh, then you can't uh, tell the difference between kind of the left and the right sort of situation. And uh, when you're in a more confident situation, you're okay with um, more autonomous decisions. Um, whereas if you're in a less confident situation, you really want to pass the decisions off to a human, like an expert dermatologist. Um, so then moving on, uh, so now we're in the evaluation stage, right? Um, uh, so again, uh, this would be the uh, model risk, uh, uh, model validation sort of uh, stage, right? Uh, so what we want to, again, make sure about is we're taking advice from a panel of diverse voices um, in order to uh, ensure that um, uh, things, uh, all sorts of harms are potentially flagged and identified. Okay. Uh, then in the monitoring stage, um, again, first thing is uh, to actually monitor it. Um, don't let your model just run um, uh, without paying attention to, to how it's doing. Um, secondly, uh, don't just monitor for accuracy, um, but monitor for things like fairness, adversarial robustness, explainability, and, and so forth, so that um, uh, we're, we're actually um, making sure that these things are also um, uh, in, in good situations. Okay. Um, so overall message uh, for uh, trustworthy AI when you're building it is uh, don't take shortcuts anywhere in the life cycle. And um, I've kind of uh, illustrated uh, this general idea um, through these examples. And um, uh, the book, uh, I mean, goes into uh, to greater depth for, for all of this stuff. Right? Um, so now in the second half, I just wanted to move on a little bit. Um, uh, let me just check the the chat, if there's anything else um, that I can mention right now. No, um, so I'll, I'll keep men mentioning things. I think there were more governance sort of questions. So now I'm gonna um, actually move into the, the governance part, okay? Um, all right, uh, so this word governance is a bit weird, right? Um, 
So it actually is derived from this other word, governor, and that's a device to measure and regulate a machine. So uh, this picture is a governor from a steam engine from like the 1800s, right? Um, so it's also known as a controller, okay? Um, so when we say governance, uh, what we are talking about is the act or process of overseeing the control and direction of something. And in the sense of AI governance, um, there's lots and lots of different definitions floating around. Um, they usually do refer in some capacity to responsible or trustworthy AI. Um, and usually AI governance is uh, used to refer to kind of uh, decision-making uh, applications, not uh, uh, cyber physical systems like um, uh, self-driving cars or robotic surgery or things like that. Um, it might refer to laws and regulations, it might be quite philosophical, but um, what I wanted to do um, in this, uh, in this uh, lecture, I guess, was um, uh, to be a little bit more engineering oriented around it, right? Um, so if a governor, if governance is about a governor or a controller, um, what we should maybe be thinking about is um, what's a typical control system. Uh, so if there's any engineers listening, um, this picture is probably very familiar to you. Um, uh, this is a very basic diagram of a control system. Uh, so think about a thermostat in your house. Um, if it senses that um, the temperature is too low compared to the reference uh, temperature that you want it to be, um, the controller then instructs the furnace to turn on and um, uh, that raises the temperature, which that get, then gets sensed and then um, it eventually will stop the, the furnace from turning on. Right? Um, similarly, the cruise control on your car, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, so what is the control theory perspective on machine learning systems? Uh, so what does a machine learning pipeline look like to a control engineer? Um, so the thing to start with, instead of a reference signal like the temperature or the speed, the temperature of your house or the speed of your car, it's values. Um, what do we want actually um, from uh, these systems as, uh, as society is informing them? Uh, we have data scientists who are acting as the controllers. They're building models um, that are the things that are then offering the predictions that we can then test to uh, generate facts that, that we can then compare to the values that we have uh, to sense some sort of misalignment and then take actions as data scientists uh, going forward. Okay. Um, and these values actually should start even earlier with some sort of um, guiding principles that we're um, using to elicit more specific values that we can compare to uh, uh, things that you can test for. Okay. Um, so in the remainder of the time, um, I'll kind of go through different parts of this diagram here. Um, so the first is uh, the principles themselves, okay? Um, so there's lots of uh, AI ethics principles that have come out from different organizations over the last few years. Um, so most of them have uh, spanned uh, across different types of organizations, so private industry, governments, and civil society. Um, but uh, they've also mostly been focused on or coming from economically developed countries and uh, usually stemming more from a Western philosophy um, starting point. Um, there's kind of five common uh, coarse grain principles that have emerged um, in these uh, like hundreds of uh, AI ethics principles. Um, so uh, there's privacy, there's fairness and justice, there's safety and reliability, there's transparency, which um, often people will lump in explainability with transparency, and then there's social responsibility and beneficence. Okay, so it's not that different from what I had uh, kind of talked about earlier. Okay, um, but there are differences across the sectors. So governments um, <clears throat> emphasize a few more things. So they emphasize economic growth and productive employment. Um, they also kind of bring in these uh, things related to an arms race among countries. So uh, one country needs to keep up with uh, the rest of the world and so forth in their AI. Okay. Um, private industry tends to be um, uh, most narrow, um, so they don't add anything usually to these common principles. And uh, some people would argue that uh, private industry is just uh, doing this in a performative sense and uh, doing this in a so-called ethics washing sort of sense. Okay, And then there's civil society. Um, and one thing to know is that civil society, um, so NGOs, um, uh, things like that, um, they often exist as a criticism to government and to private industry. So um, often uh, their uh, principles are rooted in critical theory. 
um, with an emphasis on shifting power to the most vulnerable members of society. Um, so we have the principles. Then the next question is uh, the value elicitation, and this would happen in the uh, uh, problem specification phase of the life cycle. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so using the principles as the starting point, we would like to specify the desired behavior of a system. And there's kind of four levels of elicitation. Um, so should you work on a problem, which pillars of trustworthiness are of concern? What are the appropriate metrics? And then what are the acceptable ranges of values of those metrics? Okay. Um, so first to ask the question, should you even work on a problem, right? Uh, so there's all sorts of reasons why you maybe won't want to. So if a system that is getting created leads to um, users getting addicted, if it's um, making bullying or stalking or theft or fraud easier, if it's um, enabling the repression of dissent, et cetera, um, there might be lots of uh, potential reasons why uh, you might not want to work on uh, a particular problem. And there's no right or wrong answer to this. This is a value judgment. So some people are okay, some people um, might disagree and, and so forth, right? Um, so there's this formalism called CP nets, um, so conditional preference networks, um, which lets you actually aggregate, um, uh, I mean, preferences of individual things to an overall uh, sort of uh, uh, set of preferences. And this is an example, uh, which is kind of a, a logical or of um, these eight different things that I had on the previous screen. So um, if any of them is true, then you would probably not want to work on the problem. But again, your values might be different. Okay. Um, then we have um, uh, the second level of question. So this is the pillars of trustworthiness. Which ones are of concern? So uh, for my given problem, uh, is fairness important? Is explainability um, important, et cetera? Right? Um, so it's usually hard to ask people directly about these questions. So like, do you care about distributional robustness? It's hard to answer. So. Um, we can have um, a simpler set of um, things that people have more direct experience with uh, that they're better able to answer about. So, um, <clears throat> so I'm not going to read these um, in detail, but um, there's things like, uh, uh, does the system have the possibility of giving systematic disadvantage? Um, is there a regulator involved? Um, uh, can an affected user challenge the system and, and so forth? Right? Um, so with these as sort of questions, then you can um, build another one of these CP nets um, to inform uh, the, these pillars of trustworthiness, right? Uh, so if we look at fairness as an example, so if there is the possibility of systematic disadvantage and the data is, or the problem is related to people, um, then maybe fairness is important to consider. Um, looking at distributional robustness, um, if the system is being retrained frequently, then maybe I don't need distributional robustness. But if it's not being retrained frequently, then maybe I do. Okay. Um, so again, you can put together um, uh, these conditional preference tables to um, uh, kind of give you a sense of what is the most, uh, what's high priority, what's low priority in a particular problem. And again, uh, there's no one right or wrong answer to this, um, but uh, this is an example of the, the sort of things that you can do. Um, so now third level of um, elicitation. Um, so what are the appropriate metrics for the different pillars of trustworthiness? And here, um, uh, different worldviews play an important role. Um, so for example, in uh, fairness, if you believe there is social bias, that leads you to, in one direction. If uh, you don't believe there is social bias, that leads you to, some, to a different direction. So, if you believe there is um, social bias in the measurement process, then there's a fairness metric called statistical parity difference, um, which is probably a, a good one to use. If you don't, then uh, average odds difference or average predictive value difference might be a, a better choice. And among those two, if the favorable label, um, so getting hired um, is assistive, getting um, promoted, uh, getting a loan, all of those are assistive, uh, then average odds difference might make sense. But um, if it's a non-punitive sort of favorable thing, so not getting arrested, not getting fired and so forth, then maybe average predictive value difference is a better choice for you. So those are kind of things to think about, right? Um, but if you don't wanna think in that way, another way to go is um, actually through pairwise comparisons by um, uh, asking uh, a user to look at different confusion matrices and give their judgment about those, which do they prefer? 
and that helps people reason as well. And you can get uh, fairness metrics or um, accuracy metrics or other things out of these uh, comparisons. Um, then the last question among the four is um, what are acceptable ranges of the metric values? Um, so the first three didn't require us to consider more than one dimension at a time. Um, but when we're considering ranges, we do need to consider the trade-offs and the non-trade-offs and only choose ranges that are feasible. Um, because uh, there is, I mean, something where you can't, ex I mean, have a one single system that's like at 100% accuracy and um, fully explainable and um, has the best uncertainty quantification and so forth. So um, this is an open area of research of how to even define these feasible sets of, um, uh, of models that uh, can uh, achieve these things in a way that you want. And when you're trying to elicit them, um, there's different ways you can do it through visualization, um, through, uh, again, pairwise comparisons. Um, so you show people some scenarios and what do they prefer and so forth. Um, and overall, um, among all of the four levels, one thing to emphasize is that um, uh, if you are involving a group of stakeholders, including affected users from vulnerable communities, um, a voting scheme is probably not the right thing to do, um, which is where most of the um, uh, research on CPNets and prairie-wise comparisons um, boils down to, because minority voices might raise important points that uh, would be drowned out by the majority in a voting scheme. So uh, more participatory design sessions would be preferred. Um, so just moving on very quickly on testing. So once you have your model, how do you test? Um, so machine learning testing is a bit challenging because it's different than regular software testing um, because you don't know what the right answer is supposed to be. You don't know, I mean, in regular software testing, two plus two equals four, and that's what you're testing for. But um, um, machine learning is all about generalization. So um, uh, for a given input, you, you can't know in advance what the output prediction is supposed to be. Um, but there's ways using metamorphic relations, um, which is the idea that uh, two data points um, can be known to um, require the same output, predict output prediction, even if you don't know what that is going to be. So um, there's ways to, to do this. Um, and there's very like open areas of research right now on um, kind of test case generation, um, defining coverage metrics and, and so forth. Um, so then once you've done the testing, there's the collection of facts, right? Um, so one thing that we emphasize is that um, to uh, have a good governance sort of system, uh, you need to be collecting these facts, um, quantitative and qualitative facts from throughout the life cycle, um, from the different personas um, uh, at the point that they're generated. And all of these can then be um, uh, collected uh, somewhat automatedly and um, then rendered out to um, different so-called fact sheets. Um, so they could be very detailed for a data scientist. They could be a small label um, for uh, the general public. Uh, they could uh, relate to compliance requirements, SR 11.7, et cetera, et cetera, um, to, uh, uh, to meet uh, particular requirements. So SDOC here stands for Suppliers Declaration of Conformity. Um, so then uh, we last point to make before I end um, is the data scientists themselves, right? Um, so as we know, people are involved in every part of the life cycle. Um, so a question you might ask is diversity of lived experience help in creating trustworthy machine learning? So it's very easy to say without really thinking about it that yes, diversity is good, but why? Why is that the case, right? Um, so it turns out that uh, there's what's called an epistemic advantage from lived experience of marginalization. So um, what that means is that um, a person who um, uh, has experienced harms themselves, oppression themselves, is better able to recognize harms in general, not just things that would apply to their own group, but to all groups. Um, and this is missing from people who have never experienced any harm and, and so forth. Right? Um, so that's one reason. Second is that just um, having diversity um, helps the team slow down and be more deliberative. So it doesn't matter if all the people know exactly the same thing. If they're socioculturally different, they will stop and talk more um, and, and so forth. So both of those combine to uh, uh, emphasize the uh, diversity uh, being a good thing. Um, but it's not necessarily good in every part, right? Um, so it's most useful um, in the problem specification and data understanding phases, as well as in the evaluation phase. 
it's less useful um, when you're doing the data prep and modeling as well as the uh, deployment because um, any really good skilled um, data scientist can do a good job if they've been given a, a problem specification that's very precise and includes all of the harms that uh, need to be identified. Right, so that implies that as we move towards more auto um, uh, components of the machine learning um, process, then um, uh, it's actually okay because the human aspects need to be more in the front and the, the bottom uh, than anywhere else. Okay. Um, so just to wrap up, um, uh, so just like uh, with commercial aviation, the first 50 years were all about just getting planes to fly. Um, uh, and the second 50 years since 1958, when the commercial jet kind of got finalized with the Boeing 707, um, there has not been a fundamental change in how aircraft fly, um, but vastly, vastly improved safety, efficiency, and remission. Uh, so we're now at the start of the second 50 years of AI as well. Um, so this is exactly now why it needs to uh, uh, be the focus for us developing more safe, reliable, fair, uh, trustworthy, efficient, and automated AI systems. Uh, so let me stop there. Um, again, the book link is trustworthymachinelearning.com. So uh, uh, let, let me see if I can uh, answer any questions, uh, discuss anything that, that you guys wanted. So um, uh, let me see if there's anything in the chat that I should cover. Um, I think there's one question, <clears throat> question about uh, mm -hmm. you know, the governance model needed for AI systems. Yeah. Uh, you know, typically, you know, in most financial institutions, you mm -hmm. have, you know, kind of uh, what are called as the lines of defense, right? So in the yeah. first line, second line, third line, and then mm -hmm. you have a governance, mm -hmm. basically kind of structuring the policies and processes in place, and then, then there's operationalization of these. So. How do you see, you know, AI governance? And mm -hmm. I mean, it may be even mm -hmm. a novel concept for other industries wherein mm -hmm. they're starting from scratch. They have a, you know, data scientists and machine learning engineers, mm -hmm. but absolutely have yeah. you know, no context of governance. Right. So what do you think about that? Yeah, so I definitely believe the financial services industry is ahead of the game because of um, the history of being regulated. Um, so the uh, this SR 11.7 that I mentioned being one part of that, but in general, um, uh, so yes, uh, so I think other industries are probably behind and would actually learn a lot from uh, financial services. And we see this talking with uh, customers across industries. So um, to me, I mean, the governance brings together two things, right? One is the elicitation, which I talked about. What are the things, what are the guardrails that you want to set? Um, so do you want there to be a disparate impact ratio between whatever 0.8 and 1.25 or something like that? So um, the elicitation aspect. And then the other part of it is the um, uh, actually measuring and testing these things in as much an automated fashion as you can, because um, once you've specified your ranges, then whenever you test it, then it needs to actually match and be in those ranges, right? So um, uh, as much as we can um, be uh, instituting automated uh, tools and technologies for AI governance um, uh, that are capturing all those facts throughout the life cycle, maintaining the provenance of them and um, uh, so that they're able to be compared to what we actually wanted, then um, uh, we're setting ourselves up to, uh, to do a good job for, for this. And I think, um, uh, so I mean, just from the IBM perspective, um, uh, we just uh, a couple of months ago released an AI governance product, which um, uh, actually is based on this uh, fact sheets concept and it does do these things for you. So um, there's a regulatory compliance part, um, uh, which is based on this IBM open pages thing, and then the uh, capturing of facts and, and comparison part. So um, no, things are happening. And I think uh, the more we can uh, enable this, uh, it'll be good for, for, for the industry and all industries actually. Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to pick up on two things you mentioned. One is yeah. the automation part. Yeah. Um, and I've heard that multiple times, you know, when, mm -hmm. when you talk about, you know, kind of, I mean, we are in a stage of economy wherein there is a severe skills shortage mm -hmm. and most people would want to go and build models rather yeah. than think about being the people who are going to prevent models from going into production. Yeah. or ask a lot of questions and yeah. kind of do the due diligence. I mean, yeah. I kind of going by, go back to my engineering days, you know, do you want to be a design engineer? So you want to be a QA engineer? It's like mm -hmm. design engineering is better. Yeah. 
Yeah. Because I want to build new things rather than yeah. build in the quality assurance test yeah. and all that fun stuff, right? Yeah. So I see in my that in my students too. You know, when I ask yeah. students like, what do they want to be? They want to always start with, I want to be data scientists. Mm -hmm. um, so automation definitely helps because you're yeah. not going to you know bake things from scratch. Yeah. But um, the question goes to why we're yeah. doing all these things, right? Because yeah. and you know, there's a context piece. Mm -hmm. um, why do we need to do uncertainty quantification? Why do we need to do fairness testing? Why do we need to do explainability? Why do we need to think about security? Yeah. Um, I understand from an engineering perspective, here are all the possible things you could do. Yeah. But uh, where do we bring in the context? Because I, I yeah. kind of even see a role of someone saying, yeah. this is important in here because yeah. mm -hmm. these are relevant, these are yeah. regulated, these yeah. are aspects which is going to really cause something bad to happen versus yeah. this is something which um, you know, you want to kind of templatize and say, mm -hmm. let's run this soup to nuts just because mm -hmm. it's going to give us this 360 degree perspective of what's happening. Yeah, no, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of people think that way. I mean, I do it myself. I mean, the building part is the fun part, right? Um, so <clears> let me <throat> extend my analogy from the, uh, the commercial aviation sort of um, uh, mm -hmm. analogy, right? So, uh, I don't know too much about flying planes, but I know there's takeoff, there's cruising, there's landing, right? Um, and uh, the takeoff and the landing is where the human uh, touch is the most important. The cruising is where the pilot can put it on autopilot and you're flying in a straight line um, a lot of the time, right? So the automation that's happening, um, like I was saying, is uh, mostly going to, I think, uh, uh, I mean, automate some of the um, uh, feature engineering aspects as well as the... Um, uh, like building models and scoring them automatically. So the system can build you whatever a thousand models and then score them according to your criteria and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think those are happening already and will continue to happen. But to me, actually, um, what we should emphasize to people is not that you're doing QA or things like that, but exactly what you said, right? Asking the question of, um, like, why are we doing this? What do we care about? And um, uh, like mapping things from the policies, from regulations um, and so forth, from our societal sort of goals um, into these quantitative uh, sort of requirements that the automation can then take care of. And uh, to me, I think that is the, the essence of humanity in a sense, right? I mean, uh, look, what is it about humans that is true about us and not about machines? It's that we can care, we can have empathy, and we can uh, kind of uh, understand others and um, kind of uh, uh, do things in the right way, right? So, um, so to me, I mean, that's why we actually want that human touch uh, exactly at those points. And luckily for us, that's also the um, part that isn't being automated, um, because mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that is exactly what shouldn't be automated. Uh, so if people are familiar with this uh, uh, cartoon from the 60s, the Jetsons, right? I mean, the job of um, uh, George Jetson was to go in in the morning, push a button to get the machine started. And then at the end of the day, you just pushed a button to make it stop, right? Um, that was his whole job. And it's, I mean, obviously a hyperbole, but um, in a sense, I mean, the human control over the machines is what uh, what we need. And um, I think uh, the most we can, uh, uh, I mean, do to emphasize why it's an important thing is to um, uh, kind of show people like all of the bad things that can happen, like you were saying, right? So mm -hmm. if we don't do uncertainty quantification, right, then our dermatologist, um, isn't going to be in the loop. And then the system will say that uh, uh, you have a disease when you actually didn't, or there was a very 50-50 um, like chance that you had it or didn't have it, right? Um, if we don't do um, fairness stuff, then uh, uh, these particular groups are going to suffer. They're going to um, end up worse off than uh, even if there was no system at all. So, uh, so I think all of those things are uh, the things to emphasize as we um, kind of work towards uh, uh, trustworthy AI. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a great answer. I mean, you now I struggle at times to um, even introduce concepts because concepts without context mm -hmm. is always something like, well, we are computing all these metrics. Yeah. Why are we? doing all these things and you know at least yeah. from an industry perspective there is always mm -hmm. a challenge of balancing mm -hmm. you know the business objectives and wanting yeah. to get ahead 
you know, right. financial markets, the mm-hmm. uh, PL, and mm-hmm. um, but also risk has always been mm-hmm. uh, you know a part and parcel of the financial industry. But also it's a it's an area wherein um, mm-hmm. many risk managers I know mm-hmm. are not just super mathematicians, mm-hmm. but also are very high context people because yeah. they know where things could go wrong and they're very effective communicators yeah. because the, it's not about just scaring people. It's also about like, you know, relaying the value out of it. And exactly. in some ways I still exactly. struggle to sometimes look at like the, what is the value proposition of, you know, the various metrics we're generating. And I think it's, it's, it's an area where we are still in a constant state of evolution because many of these explainability metrics and the methodologies are still, you know, in research papers. We don't have like pragmatic use spaces or even like, you know, regulators saying you got to be calculating all these aspects. Um, Now you mentioned something about ethics washing, which I'm, Mm -hmm. um, I'm very concerned about. I mean, Mm -hmm. and then many, many times um, you also mentioned about, you know, the, the movement from people, about like, you know, thinking about, well, how do we kind of bring this critical theory mm-hmm. and then think about like, you know, transferring power to yeah. potentially the discriminated and people who may be mm-hmm. affected, right? Yeah. Um, many times, like I see a lot of, you know, uh, interest and also uh, the, the goodwill and they want to do the real thing. Mm-hmm. But many times it just stays in these beautiful PDF documents and brochures yep. and yep. research papers and never right. gets operationalized in the industry. Yeah. Um, and also, I think the, the, the articulation of you mm-hmm. know, ethics mm-hmm. and what are important aspects. So I'm, 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 you know, I'm kind of you know, just laying out the stage in here. I mean, like, what, what, what do you think as the most pragmatic way of operationalizing yeah. ethics? Is it more from yeah. an engineering perspective wherein we kind of gravitate mm-hmm. towards specifics and say, okay, look mm-hmm. guys, if you calculate these, analyze mm-hmm. these yeah. in uh, SQA, statistical yeah. quality control, it's very clear when you, know, you yeah. look statistics and you say, mm-hmm. you know, there is this level of uh, statistical tests, conference mm-hmm. intervals, yeah. And if this passes all these things, the product is ready to go to production, else no, mm-hmm. kind of a thing. Yeah. Where is that line in ethics? Because, you know, yeah. we are now thinking so many mm-hmm. concepts. It's not just yeah. engineering. It's about right. social sciences, about yeah. how we have evolved as a society. Yeah. And yeah. also what we see as the future of the society when mm-hmm. AI and machine learning are going to be, you mm-hmm. know, regular topics of uh, discussion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's an important point. So um, a lot of activism has spurred, I mean, this field, but um, to me, the most practical way of um, actually uh, making change is by starting with processes that are already part of um, how things are done, right? So the model risk management and and so forth. So uh, to me, what I think we should be doing is um, uh, kind of just clarifying um, what sort of risks that we actually do care about, and then expanding upon them uh, and uh, kind of building the processes in in that fashion. Because, um, yeah, I mean, if you start with this um, vision that I'm going to just burn everything down and start from scratch or something like that, it's not possible. It's not practical at all, right? So um, you have to make small changes um, and uh, really be very practical about it. So, um, yeah, I mean, already there's whatever laws for fairness or other things. So just operationalize them, um, bring them into the exact workflows and processes that exist. And um, uh, I think that's how to, to, to go about it because there's no other way. I mean, uh, it comes down to uh, kind of, as you were alluding to a question of power, right? And um, the power that does exist is not um, uh, the one that uh, is the critical theory um, kind of power, right? So. Um, it has to be um, kind of expanding from the point of view of safety, from risk, from uh, from those sort of aspects, and then going from there. And uh, and it, it'll give us, I mean, ethical um, sort of things as well. I mean, safety to me and ethics are actually pretty much the same thing. I mean, uh, there's some distinction, obviously, but uh, uh, I don't think there's a huge difference between being risk averse or being safe versus um, being ethical. So, uh, so I think that's uh, that's how we go about it. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Agish. I know we have a couple more questions and mm-hmm. discussions, but it's one o'clock. I mm-hmm. I know uh, you have a busy day, and you're also involved with uh, 
couple of other aspects in the in the risk space. So um, thanks again for making time for us. This was an excellent discussion. And um, uh, I'm a big fan of your work. Uh, as I said, this, this book has been very helpful in clarifying various concepts. And uh, for people who attended this session, uh, we're going to do a drawing at the end. I know many people had to drop out. It's at one o'clock. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick a name for all the people who have attended today's session, and we will send you a note, and we will uh, be happy to ship you a copy of uh, Kush's uh, new book, Trustworthy Machine Learning. Uh, so thanks again, Kush. And uh, for people who have joined us for the first session, uh, as you know, we um, have been hosting these sessions for the past two years. Every Tuesday at 12 o'clock East Coast time, we're going to have one discussion. Next week's discussion is about uh, machine learning and model risk management. And we'll have a masterclass or tutorial formatted class. Um, so I hope you can join us next Tuesday at 12 East Coast time. If you are not on our mailing list, just go to www.quantuniversity.com so that you can get invitations to future sessions. So thanks again, and we will see you soon in another week. Take care. Bye-bye.